I'm really happy to be able to do this presentation right now. And, um, and, and I'm hoping that each of you leave with uh, a few things that will be valuable to you, both right now during this crisis and, and when we uh, come out of it. And uh, so that's my intention today is, uh, is to do that. Um, my work at Panky has been primarily in Essentials One, working with my great friend, Dr. Jeff Baggett, who leads Essentials One, and, and I have just loved that. And uh, so I'm looking forward to the next Essentials One in August that I get to participate in. So what I'm gonna propose to you is that values-based organizations have a competitive advantage in the marketplace, a significant competitive advantage. And I hope to illustrate some of those advantages both from dental practices, somewhat my experiences, but also from case studies uh, of successful organizations. Because really these concepts uh, hold true whether you have a micro enterprise as we do being dental practice leaders and owners or you're operating a major business. Today, I believe that we'll have some team members on a podcast or on the webinar. I hope so, because I have designed this with you in mind. So what I'm gonna present, I believe, holds true, especially for all of us at any level or any position in a dental practice or, or other organizations. Quite frankly, it really holds true on the most important organization, which is your family. So let's, let's take a look. Um, structures determine performance is, is a concept that I was taught in, uh, in my coaching program, and I believe that that's really true. And so values create a lot uh, or contribute a lot to structure. So the first thing that I would say is they help to structure relationships. What I mean is help to inform us about what's important in relationships, how do we think about relationships on our team, uh, with our patients, with our colleagues, and how do we order things around relationships? So values really tell us something about what the importance of relationships are to each of us individually. And of course, we'll each have a unique look at that. The next thing is that values really contribute to the structure of clinical and business standards. I put that up there purposefully because right now standards matter. In fact, they matter more than ever because we're going from the world that we used to know into a new world. And that new world comes with a demand and a need for the highest of infection control standards. But really, when you are an organization committed to standards, then how you're perceived and really how your team participates in that uh, is determined a lot by that commitment level. In other words, it bleeds over into other areas, not just a specific area of practice or business. And finally, um, our values tell us how processes should support or be integrated with those standards. And, and so what I mean by that is if your goal is to have a relationship based practice, and I know many of you on this webinar already have fantastic relationship based practices, but perhaps your goal is to enhance that even further or maybe you're a younger practitioner or newer to dentistry on a team, and so you're trying to, to build that. Well, how you integrate uh, your values into the practice should inform the processes. So if we want a relationship-based practice, then we need to order our new patient process so it's focused on building relationships. Uh, if we want certain other objectives or goals, we just have to think about how our values uh, drive the processes that fit the standards, and that's the structure of our practice. One of the uh, Panky webinars from last week, I got to watch the recording of, and that was Kevin Quechen that did um, uh, a webinar on core systems. I would highly recommend that you go listen to that recording. Kevin is a talented guy. Obviously, this is one area where he has a lot of talent. I, I watched it, I stopped it, I took notes, I rewrote my notes. And as I was listening to everything Kevin was talking about, it made me think of this, processes and standards that I fit into how my practice worked. So go back and find Kevin's uh, webinar. I think you'll find it extraordinarily helpful. 
So if we were going to think about values, uh, that's a word that's used a lot and certainly means something uh, uniquely to each person. What I would propose to you is that every organization has a map of reality, meaning a map that says this is possible, this isn't possible. And your values are going to inform that map a lot. I want you to think about if you're on a journey or you're on a hike in a national park, you're going to need some kind of map to orient where you are to where you're going and how you need to get home. If that map accurately reflects the land, then you're good. But if that map does not accurately reflect the reality of that land, you're lost. So values really help to provide structure as you create your map of uh, what's possible, what's not possible, and how you're to navigate the journey. So right now, I think values are our friends because they create foundation, they create structure in under any circumstance. But in a crisis, I think they're even more important because we, one, both have to hold on to what's true and what do we believe and what's important to us, and also uh, the knowledge that after this is over with, those same things are still gonna be important to us. Our heart's still gonna long for the same things. So I think they're critical, especially in times of crisis. And, and values make meaning possible uh, and build resilience. I put those two together just because, um, you know, we all grow very weary of trials and tribulations and, and all the, the problems that we're facing right now. But <clears throat> um, meaning is the thing that can come from those trials and tribulations because from the heart of suffering, uh, we're learning a lot about how to survive and thrive. And so meaning is really rooted in values. And of all the things that a human being needs, I think meaning tops the list because we can endure a lot if there's meaning from our trials and tribulations. I think the other thing is that your values, when they're visible and evident to the rest of your world, it informs them about who you are and what's important to you. It's the Simon Sinek idea that when you're crystal clear on your why, that other people that are attracted to that why are attracted to you. So it attracts, uh, your values attract like-minded people, resources, and opportunities. And I just want you to, again, think about the life of L.D. Pankey. Once Dr. Pankey made a decision that he was going to help people save their teeth and rehabilitate dentitions that had really suffered a lot of damage, without anybody knowing how to do that, including himself, it was quite a commitment for him to make, but that was based in his values, what he believed, what his heart wanted. And so as he committed to that and developed conviction, the people, the resources, and the opportunities that he needed came his way. Just like today, as you develop conviction about the values that are important to you and your organization, the same thing will happen. So if I was going to share things that I think are uh, values that are essential to Team Mac, these are the things that come to my mind. If they were contributing to this, uh, to this webinar, uh, they're, they're listening as we speak, but if they were speaking, they would add some themselves. But the first thing that I would say is the truth, because truth is essential if we're going to be connected to facts. And in a crisis, being connected with facts and understanding and thinking and operating and feeling any, any ways from facts is critical. The next thing is that for us, we think that every person is important. Uh, it's grounded in the Judeo-Christian idea that men and women are created in the image of God and therefore have ultimate value. Well, even my friends who are of different belief systems uh, are very, very attracted to the idea of the worth of each person. So we order what we do around the fact that the patient that we've been entrusted to, the team member that's come our way, the colleague that we work with, the lab technician who helps to build our restorations, all of those people are essentially enormously valued. And so we're to think about them that way. So that really permeates a lot of what we do. 
another one that I think is real important uh, is being your authentic self. And so that comes from Herb Kelleher, of, uh, founder of Southwest Airlines. And Herb was quite colorful, quite the character, usually had a cigarette and a glass of whiskey in his hand, uh, but people loved him because Herb believed in his people being themselves authentically. And I think you probably have more fun on Southwest Airlines than a lot of other airlines, but that was Herb. I think it works great because it allows a person to bring out their best self. So being your authentic self to me is critical. And then self-leadership, you know, leadership always starts with leading yourself and, and what self is showing up is your best self showing up or is some other diminished self showing up. So self-leadership is a critical um, value for me uh, in, in my practice. And so that means I, mean, I need people who lead themselves well, who are self-managing, self-starters, who get an assignment and take it. And that's exactly what happens uh, with my team. I'm really proud of them and how they're going through this right now. Uh, but that's the kind of uh, team that they are. I had a great conversation about this today with Aiden, who's uh, Joanne's youngest son. And we were talking about uh, the value of responsibility and self-responsibility. And I said to, to Aiden, I said, you know, he's a college student now. And I said, you know, do you know how important or how helpful it is to a leader, to a business owner, to a boss, to a manager, to whomever, when he has somebody on his team or she has somebody on her team that they can give an assignment to, and then they know that person's got that assignment, they're going to finish it to the best of their ability, and they can stop worrying about it. I said, that's extraordinarily powerful. And that's the, that's the thing that a self-leading person does. They bear the weight for the leader and help to have a better collective self in the organization. If you came in my office, you would hear a lot of laughter and you would see a lot of humor and a lot of fun. Sometimes it could use a few more boundaries uh, to keep it on the appropriate scale. But nonetheless, I want laughter in my office because if, if people are laughing, I know they're good. And I think it just changes the experience for the patient and actually for for my team. So there's a lot of laughter. We value that. And then finally, of course, team is, uh, team is everything. And, and we look upon how we work as partnering with our patients, but also partnering with the people that we collaborate with, our interdisciplinary team, uh, our lab technicians. And so we think about them really just as an extension of our team because we think about our work as a true partnership. As time goes on, as I work with patients, I think about our work together much more as a partnership than, than anything else. So, so those are the things that come up to me. Those are values that to me are real general and um, kind of reflect my most deeply held beliefs and my team's most deeply held beliefs. And we worked through that over time. If you wanted a deeper dive into values, I would point you to Paul Henney, who runs the Bob Barkley Study Club Facebook group. Paul's written a lot about that lately. Uh, or Mary Osborne or Sherry Kay, who speak and write and think extensively uh, about the role of, of values in, in life and in business. So, a lot of that can sound like a lot of psychological psychobabble, if you would, like the things that we're all tired of hearing and not very practical. So I want to give you a case study uh, that is, is historic, and that's Alan Mulally, who is the CEO of Ford Motor Company from 2006 and 2014. And I'm going to, as we go through this, read a couple of excerpts from an article about Alan, so my apologies, but I want to make sure I, I get this right. Ford was broken. And when I say they were broken in 2006, I don't mean their profit or their share price. I mean the organization. And Alan would say that the only way to restore uh, what is now broken and to become the best is with values-based leadership. So that's what he did. And he defined the five bests uh, of leadership as best self, best team, best partner, best investment, and best citizen. So five, the five best permeated the organization and their historic turnaround. So <clears throat> the best self is again, the person who's capable of leading themselves and who's capable of and does 
develop self-awareness uh, and self-knowledge at a level uh, that all leaders and, and great team members uh, mean. He would define leadership as having a compelling vision, a comprehensive plan, relentless implementation, and talented people working together. And, and, and also people all want meaning. They want to know that they're doing great things, that they're touching a lot of lives and going someplace important. So being the best self for him wrapped all of uh, those things together. The best team was about the team feeling aligned with the work and the direction of the organization. So my question for you right now today is, do you and your team feel aligned? in this crisis and where you're going afterwards because we're going back or we're going to a new world we're not going to the same one we're going to a new one so do you have alignment around that have you worked on that and if not now is a great time to do that when uh uh when we talked about uh partnering um, i'm thinking about <clears throat> certainly partnering with the patient certainly partnering with my team but I'm also thinking about partnering with my colleagues, the specialists that we work with. And we have a great specialty team and I trust them implicitly. And that's the way I refer patients to them. That's how we work together through great success or through difficulties in a case that doesn't change because I wanna be a good partner and they're great partners to me. And so being a good partner is kind of a two way street. We, we worked out protocols and how we work together and we hold ourselves accountable to that, but we also support one another. So I think partnering is, is critical and uh, going to be more critical as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> the best citizen piece is just about it, you know, how you show up uh, in the world, meaning in your small world, your community, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, to be that best citizen. And, and that shows up a variety of ways. Even today in our uh, team Zoom meeting that we had today, you know, we found out that um, there are more people in our community that are not being able to get in touch with their dentist to be, get help with emergencies. Well, we certainly wanna do that and, and give them at least a temporary help uh, for their problems and show up that way. So I think things like that are, are about being a best citizen. One of the great stories that came from this turnaround, this historic turnaround at Ford, uh, when Alan Mulally was CEO, was this. He testified before the Congress, the United States Congress, in regards to bailouts for GM and Chrysler. And he testified on behalf of them. He actually requested that they get the bailouts because he knew that the industry would be stronger with a healthy GM and a healthy Chrysler. Now that's extraordinary because he's there trying to assist his competitors, but he, but he was right and he knew he was right about that. And I think that's being a great, a great citizen. So even in the midst of crisis or turnaround, sometimes we have to turn our eyes away from what's good just for us to what's really good for the community and the people around us. So <clears throat> as we kind of think about the role of values, I see them as shaping practice culture or organizational culture. And I also uh, see them as the boss. And so uh, this little guy right here clearly is the boss in his world. Um, but sometimes the questions that come up are, um, you know, how do you behave as a boss? And I will tell you that well done values do it. So let me tell you what I mean. Going back to the Ford story with Alan Mulally, he's famous for not firing anybody in this entire turnaround. But the way that it worked was when somebody came to him and objected to his strategies, he said, I understand, but at Ford, this is how we do it. And they would object again. And he would say, I understand, but at Ford, this is how we do it. And he was famous for one particular situation where uh, a real rock star in his company, somebody that was a high performer, really talented, super successful, came to him and wanted to do things a certain way. And he was not uh, someone who owned the value of team. And Alan Mulally said, I understand, but team is one of our five core values. And the gentleman objected again, and he said, you know, we're gonna miss you. 
because Allen didn't have to fire him. The gentleman who was rejecting the values of the organization fired himself. And I can tell you countless stories where you have a culture where everybody in that culture is in the same or similar things. And it becomes so evident when somebody is outside of those values that they kind of fire themselves or they reorient how they're thinking, how they're living to fit the values because they want to stay in there. So values have power, power to them, even in the average everyday work uh, of a dental practice. So to give a little light on a final piece of structure here, I always think that vision, mission, and values are essential when you're trying to think about how do you structure your practice, the people of your practice and your organization. So vision is really about your destination and its purpose is to provide inspiration to move you to that direction. The mission are the obstacles, the conflict, the barriers that you've got to work through, overcome in order to get to that destination. And that's the meaning. And then finally, the values are just the guides. They tell you when you're leaving uh, the, your um, direction, when you're leaving the path to your vision or not. And we all hold our, in this kind of an organization, we all hold ourselves accountable to that. So a real practical look at this kind of a story would be the Bourne movies. Most of us, at least people my age, have seen every Jason Bourne movie multiple times because they're lots of fun and they're exciting. So Jason Bourne was someone who had his identity stolen and his vision was to become whole and to regain his identity that had been stolen from him. So that was his inspiration. His mission was, he had to fight off countless bad guys in order to get to the person who might help to restore his, uh, his identity. So that was the meaning, all the things he had to do to overcome that. And we all know that no human could have lived through all that, but it makes for a great movie. And then finally, the values that were evident there is, were simple. It's not right for any person to have their identity stolen by some rogue unit of the CIA or for that matter, anybody else. So these are all the elements of story <clears throat> that made for a great movie and communicate a lot to us about our organization. So my question for you now is, what's your story? If you were to put these elements together for where you want to go and what you must do, what is your story? I would propose for most of us, our destination hadn't changed, but for all of us, our mission has changed because now uh, we have perhaps some new barriers, some bigger barriers that we just have to get through. It doesn't mean we can't or that we're not going to a better place because I believe that we are, but the mission is different. I think our values are the things that just help reassure us if we stay true to them and we're pointed in the direction of our destination that we're gonna be just fine. So <clears throat> the, the real power as I see it, of values-based leadership is that it draws out the inherent potential of your team. And in drawing out the inherent potential, I mean the hidden talent, the discretionary energy, and the passion that's present in all of them. It's really a move from compliance uh, to commitment. And you don't get commitment because it's a job description. You get commitment because somebody's heart is moved to want to do what you're doing. They're moved by the values that you believe in and you're holding yourself accountable to. But that difference moving from compliance to commitment where you really engage all of this discretionary potential is tremendously powerful. In fact, the best performing organization in the world have found a way to do that. The most enduring organizations, the most enduring practices have found a way to do that. So if you were gonna take one thing away from today about values-based leadership or the value of a value-based organization, to me it's this. How is it that your inner game is so well formed, so well developed that people are attracted to that and what you believe in and where you want to go and that you share that with your team and it, and, and it provides motivation and enthusiasm for them. So 
it reminds me of the idea that every practice, a values-based practice or otherwise, is going to face problems, that they're unavoidable. But the type of problems we face are different. So I'm gonna take you back to a meeting I was in last year, uh, a study club, if you would, with a group of primarily young dentists. And we had a speaker there who's a longtime friend, someone that I respect, admire, I've worked with. She has helped me, she's successful, she's helped countless practices. And as this young group was presenting her with situations that they wanted advice on about how to navigate through these problems, finally, after a while, I raised my hand and I referenced my, my friend or Texas endodontics and said, well, that's how I see that. And I don't see these problems here. And her answer to me was, well, of course you don't. This is, they are a values-based organization. And what she was saying to me was this, Matt, do you want to live above your problems or do you want to live in them? Because she was helping these younger dentists and they were asking for it, but she was helping them become better problem solvers. What if he didn't have that same set of problems in the first place because of the values that everybody shared in the organization and they just rose above that level of problem to a bigger problem, but, but one that's more important to solve rather than staying mired in them. And so to me, that's an illustration of the great benefit uh, of values-based organizations is the opportunity to live above certain problems, not in the middle of them, because that's exhausting. I know so many dentists that are exhausted because they're trying to be the one single person leading this team and they're mired in problems that frustrate them and disappoint them and don't help them to get to their destination. So <clears throat> to summarize a lot of the things I've said and to move on to uh, uh, an idea of culture, leadership is often thought about as being an individual thing. And it is that. It's first self-leadership, leading yourself. And whether that is um, whether you are a part of a big group or not, it starts there and then it spreads out. But when you can take values and incorporate them into the daily activities and the life and the belief of your entire team, now you're moving towards collective power and those values inform a culture that take you from an individual to a collective team that's much more capable uh, than you ever are by yourself. Today, in my uh, Zoom team meeting with my team, I just said, look, I need y'all to do certain things right now because I can't. I can only do so so much. And, and they have and they are and they will. But it's the power of, of the collective that really makes a difference in the connection are the values. So um, if we were to think about the culture of a dental practice or any organization, I always like to look at the meaning of words and where they came from. And this really spoke to me that essentially culture is about care. And, and uh, uh, when we look at how culture affects business and financial uh, performance, I think there's a lot that we can say. So on the one sense, culture is really a lot about how things feel, but on another sense, there is a business and financial performance. So in 1992, Cotter and Heskett from Harvard uh, wrote a book and published a study, and this is what they discovered. 12 firms with performance enhancing culture performed that way and 20 firms without it performed as you see. Net income growth was 756% for performance enhancing culture as compared to 1%. That's extraordinary. And every other metric is by multiples better. So that alone should encourage us to build and craft a culture rooted in values that has some power with it. Uh, and this is an old study. This is 1992, so this is almost 20 years old now. And uh, that that really informed me about the importance of culture. Well, it just uh, so happens that in 2018, 
the Harvard Business Review said, it's time for us to take an in-depth look at uh, culture and the power of culture on organizational performance. So they had an entire issue with a large section devoted to culture. So I pulled out some uh, ideas and some thoughts from that and I'd like to share them with you now because it's really, again, related to the role of values and culture. So culture is just that, the social order of an organization and it does shape what is, uh, what is good and not good in any particular um, organization. As I said earlier, I like laughter and humor in my uh, I have great friends who are great dentists who don't, that's just not their, their values. So there are things like that that are, that are unique to each organization. But I've asked many, many people uh, how they um, feel about this. And so I was uh, on a podcast once with Gary Takix and you know, Gary's a rock star. He's been in thousands of offices. He is just bright and brilliant and just a great voice and source for us these days. And I said, Gary, have you ever walked in an office before and all of a sudden it just felt bad? And have you walked in an office and it felt great? He said, absolutely, all the time. Every person I've ever asked that question of that's been in a lot of dental practices answers it the same way, no exceptions. So what they're telling us is the culture of some offices feels great and some it doesn't. So my question is, how does it feel in yours? And what have you done to make it feel great? Because how does that shape and mold your patient's experience and all the things that happen between you, your team, and your patient? And I think it's a big deal. Harvard Business Review thinks it's a big deal, so they published this issue. So uh, culture does encourage what's uh, or define what's encouraged or discouraged, good or bad, accepted or rejected. And, and again, when it's all aligned with personal values, um, then great things can happen. It produces a lot of energy. And at the end of the day, the flow of our organization through day-to-day -day activities and following our path to our destination requires a lot of energy. The exhausted dentists that I know, they're trying to bear all that burden themselves and be the go-to person. The happy, prosperous, abundant, successful dentists that I know have a team and a culture where there's a whole team full of leaders and they're all bearing the load together. They're all going a direction together. And then that preserves energy for, for everybody and creates a higher performance as we saw in the study. So if we were gonna say, how could we impact the culture? Uh, Harvard Business Review gave us four levers to look at. So the first one is to articulate your cultural aspirations and align leadership and aspirations. I would say just articulating your aspirations is a big deal anyway um, in how you message things. So if I was thinking of one of the best messaging organizations that exist today, it would be Dave Ramsey's organization because everywhere you look in anything they do, you see financial peace. And we all know that a client that goes to Dave Ramsey for financial help has financial chaos and stress and the thought of having financial peace is extraordinarily attractive to him. So Dave is saturating and articulating uh, the direction of his business and really who he's trying to attract that business. That's so, not so much cultural, but that's a great messaging idea. Um, and if we uh, were to go a step further, it would be how do we in our daily conversations at work amongst our team, with our patients, with other people, how do we saturate those conversations and what our aspirations are, what we really believe and hope for? And then how do we again design structured systems to fit all that? That's where I was going back to Kevin's webinar from last week. So right now, in my view, is the time to really take a hold of and dive deep into shaping your culture. And if you listen to me and the many conversations I've had in the last couple of weeks with my team, with my friends, with Joanne, um, you would obviously detect that my intensity level is up. 
and it is. I think the urgency and the importance level is up as, as well. So I think if we wait until we're back at work again, and as my friend Steve, a surgeon in Arkansas said, he's chopping wood all the time doing surgery and all his energy is going into that. And it's just like right now that he has time to really look at things he wouldn't have time to do otherwise. Um, I think that's where we're at. And I think that's why it's time to shape culture and our business practices right now. So what's the current culture in the crisis? And have we considered the environment, what I would call the VUCA? Uh, how does that affect it? So the VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And so right now, the environment that we're in that is off the charts. It was high before because of the speed of change of our, uh, of our world and our culture, but right now in crisis, the VUCA is unprecedented. So we have to consider that as we're looking at practice goals and working on our strategies. And we have to frame our aspirations, like our hopes and dreams in the reality of that right now and how will our mission, what will our mission have to be and do to overcome that? Um, <clears throat> so with that, there are certain things that we can bring to, uh, to the culture, to our culture that can really help, I think, to strengthen it. And I think one of them are things that we can do right now to enhance belonging and the connection of each person to the culture. need to be safe. Uh, when we're safe and connected, we feel a part of it, um, and that we know we share a future together, then all of a sudden um, barriers come down and we become more open to uh, what's in front of us and what do we need to do. So that's a key thing. And the knowledge that we're a part of a group and, and that we have high standards here, but for me to make sure that each person knows that I believe you can meet or exceed those standards is really is really a big deal. And right now, I think standards are more important than ever. And then finally, when things have gone really wrong, what do you do? Well, one of the best stories I know to illustrate that is Greg Popovich, head coach of the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, I don't even like Popovich, and I definitely don't like the Spurs because they beat my Dallas Mavericks all the time. But to be fair, I would have to respect Mr. Popovich and the Spurs for how well they've performed. Every single analysis I've ever read of the San Antonio Spurs concludes the same thing. They don't have enough talent. They don't have, an, they're too old. They're too this or that. And yet for a long period of time, they just kept winning. On June 18th, 2013, the Miami Heat beat the San Antonio Spurs to win the NBA championship. And that's after the game before uh, the Spurs had a big lead and lost the lead and lost that game and then the final game. And so his team was gutted and he knew it. And when you look at Popovich, he's old school. I see him in the face of his players. He looks like a pain. He looks difficult to play for and yet they respond to him. But what I read in the story about Popovich was what he does behind the scenes, learning each individual player, building into their life, feeding into their lives, studying them, developing them, building a relationship that has nothing to do with basketball. On June the 8th, 2013, he, uh, uh, the general manager of the Spurs said, hey, we canceling dinner. He said, nope, we're going. He got in a car, he drove to the restaurant in Miami. He orchestrated the arrangements where people were sitting, the tables, he ordered the food, he ordered wine and champagne. And slowly, uh, when the bus got there, the players unloaded and they looked like they had just uh, been destroyed. And so for the next two hours, he spent time one by one and then collectively filling their cups. And when they left, according to the general manager of the Spurs, he said they were not back to a great place, but they were whole, they were a team again. He said in decades of being affiliated with professional sports team and being a leader, he'd never witnessed anything like that before. So the belonging and the connection is about when things are tough, who shows up, how does he think, what does he prepare? Because it would have been so easy for Pop to just go home and go back to his hotel room and have a cocktail and try to drown his sorrows. But he knew that he had something to play, uh, something else to do because he had another season to play. And that's a great story of belonging and connection. So 
right now uh, with all the stress that we have from the crisis and the discontent, I think these things are even more important than ever. Listening and listening with your gut is just critical. When I get all stirred up, I don't listen well. And I have to take a step back and pause and realize I'm not with listening well. Uh, so, the, But that's critical right now. And listening for the feeling, for the emotional level of the people around you is critical. And when I'm all stirred up, I struggle to do that. And I communicate that with people. And I tell my team often, I tell Joanne often, I know I'm a pain right now. I know I'm relentless right now. But um, I intend for us to have a great future. And I'm, I'm going to leave no stone unturned. Um, and I don't know how many stones I'm going to have to turn over. So we're looking at the time after all of this to a future success and what it's going to be like and expecting that. And in all this, making sure that it's hard sometimes, especially for me, if I'm all excited and wanting to talk about something. Um, so uh, I'm very aware as you see me look away at my timer. So I try to finish somewhere on time. Uh, and because I could talk for another hour as well, uh, poor Lee has had to listen to that too many times before. So <clears throat> to finish up this section, I, I want to say that my goal with culture in this sense is to create a shared mental model, meaning where our entire team can think with one brain, speak with one voice, act with one intention, and feel with one heart. I didn't mean to click out of that, it just went there. A shared mental model means exactly that, that we know each other so well, we're aligned so well with our values, we know where we're going, we know what we want, we know each other's strengths and weaknesses so well that we think with one brain, we have one intention, we feel with one heart, we speak with one voice. And I think when you can do that as an organization, you've really got something. All of that's fueled, uh, as Rachel Botsman uh, taught me and has taught many, it's fueled by trust. So we're gonna finish with, with trust and, and how to think about trust. Rachel defines trust as a confident relationship with the unknown. Now tell me this right now, at a time of great uh, lack of confidence because none of us really know how long this crisis is gonna last and exactly what things are gonna be like every uh, afterwards. Confidence is, is enormously important. So I love her definition of this. Rachel is an Oxford professor and a thought leader um, on trust and trust in technology. But what she really spoke to me, uh, I think is represented more by this image. And so as we see this young couple hiking up a mountain, it's obvious that they have to trust each other. I mean, they're depending on one another for a fun, enjoyable, successful, and a safe hike, right? If something happens, the other one has to have the other back. So when we look at trust through that image, trust is our greatest resource, especially in a crisis. I mean, nothing beats that as a resource. Trust between uh, ourselves and our teams, trust with the patients, trust with our colleagues, nothing beats that. But what I discovered from listening to Rachel was that trust is a two-way street. It requires the other person to, to make a decision, to act, to feel. And so we can't do anything about that. But what we can do is we can work at becoming more trustworthy. And that's the key right there is to ask ourselves the question, regardless of what job we have in the practice, how can I become more trustworthy? Back to my story and talk to Aiden about this. If, if you are the person that's the assistant doing the most basic things, you know what? Nothing's more important, especially now we know that because we're not clean, disinfected and sterile. We can't get people better, period. So how do you become more trustworthy? You do your job great. You keep your promises. You be the person that, that has worked hard to make themselves more trustworthy. And you just made yourself uh, a more key player on the team. And you made your team stronger because now, just like the leader, everybody else can go focus on other jobs that they have to do. So my final case study is the Panky Institute. And I like closing with that uh, because I think it's just been a life-changing place for me and, and for so many. So I put this image up here of, of the clinic that was rebuilt a year and a half or so ago. And when I, every time I go to Panky and every time I walk in that clinic or the lab, 
I'm struck with what kind of an organization it is. I become the student by studying how we do what we do there and really what the results are like. You see a beautiful clinic here that's pristine and uh, um, that just functions very, very well. And all of these characteristics that I put here uh, on the slide are true. That it is a, uh, uh, you heard fireball. <laughs> just go off, that's my alarm that I was at my 45 minutes. And so if you don't like fireball, you're not gonna like that. <laughs> I'll turn fireball off or Joanne will. But that means be quiet, Mac, and finish. Um, so all these things are true of, of Panky, but what's visible is organized, clean, disinfected, and sterile. I mean, it's stunningly those things. And that speaks to me right now. It should speak to all of us. And I am a student of that, of that level of performance. Performance is baked in to the culture of the Panky Institute. It is obvious to Team Panky, the paid professional staff. It's obvious to me as a visiting faculty. It's obvious to the students. So I wonder what that would be like if it was baked in at that level in my practice and in yours. I think it would, we would be better. And that is very much my intention right now is to imitate that. So um, as I look at this and I, and I look in Masters Hall at, at a lecture, um, <clears throat> looks like we've got some Malin Potty images up there. And, and by the way, our sleep uh, course is uh, phenomenal. Uh, so I'm suspecting it's from that, but regardless. Um, what do you think about your brand? I used to think brands were about the graphics that we had and the logos and things like that, but it's really about the promises that you make and are you keeping them? So right now with this time, I told Team Mac that my goal to come out of, uh, of the crisis is for our patients to look back and say, wow, my team just really killed it. They took care of them, they responded, we communicated, we over communicated with them, we made sure that they knew we were there and that we would be there for them. That's my goal. What's your goal for how this is gonna come out of, of this? And then what plans can you make and are you making to make a difference in creating the culture uh, that does that very thing? So, if anybody is interested in looking into core values more, I have a core values exercise that actually my partner, Dr. Darrell Small, developed. It's really simple, really easy. It is much like things we do at the Institute uh, and that Mary Osborne or Sherry Kay have done before. But if you're interested in that, just email me. It's not on our website. I looked, I thought it was, but if you email me, I'll send it to you. I think it can be uh, incredibly value, valuable. So to put a wrap, on all this. Um, I think this is a great time for the Panky Institute. I think it's actually the best time to be a student, to be a visiting faculty member, or to be any part of the Panky family. I think our brand's going to shine right now because it reflects the values of L.D. Panky, who was a great visionary, an extraordinary clinician and person, and he, he started and has been changing lives for decades, thousands of lives all over the world. And all of that, I believe, is rooted in the values that he began and taught to his followers that formed the Institute and that now has been um, uh, continued uh, by those of us that have been blessed to be active. It is unquestionably the only reason I'm here today. It's the only reason I have many of the opportunities that I have. And so I'm just extraordinarily thankful for that. I met Lee in the first floor lab at the Panky Institute, one of her early weeks that she was a full-time faculty member there. And I'll never forget it. <clears throat> I'll get in trouble with her for telling this story, I know. But I remember all five foot two inches of her there with the tallest heels she could muster, a starched white lab coat, and she was all bowed up and ready to go slay the dragon. Um, at that time, uh, I had no idea what was inside that girl, and now I do. <clears throat> so I'm so proud of her. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. And I apologize for, <laughs> I, I was all ready not to do this, Lee, but uh, <laughs> it's a great time to be a part of Panky. And I'm thankful to have the time to spend with you today. And I'm about five minutes late right now, which I know uh, Lee is used to. 
So I see this as it's going to be our finest hour. And I'm looking forward to, um, after this is done, seeing you in October in San Antonio at our annual meeting. And let's raise a glass of champagne and let's celebrate how we all came through this. Awesome. Thank you, Mac. Fantastic. Um, I, we are going to take a couple of minutes, if you don't mind answering a couple of questions. Absolutely. Um, some of them go all the way back. So you're going to have to see how good you are at remembering what you were saying. I would struggle with this to answer a question from 30 minutes ago. But um, so one question was, what was the fifth best? So you were talking about um, the best things and somebody missed what the fifth one was. So the five best, the fifth one was uh, best citizen. The fourth one was best investment. And I actually unintentionally skipped through that. And then uh, it was best partner, best team, best self. So the fourth best was best investment. The fifth one was best citizen. Awesome. Great. Um, okay. Could you go, could you tell us again what VUCA stands for? Yeah. Uh, it's actually a term that I think was developed in the military and, and it was about their analysis of the battlefield before they went into battle. And so they analyzed the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, and the ambiguity. So, you know, the volatility speaks to itself, just how volatile dangerous is this. The uncertainty is what is it that uh, we don't know what is it that we likely don't know. So it makes it more uncertain. The complexity is just, again, the obvious. How complex is this situation or how simple is it? So that affect it. And then the ambiguity. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguity in the world today. And, and so so it's, the VUCA is that. You can Google search VUCA and find a lot that's been written on it. It's just something that came from coaching training about helping people. Um, Einstein said this. We... To, to illustrate, he said, we cannot solve the problems that we created from the same level of consciousness. And what he means is if the VUCA has been raised up and we've created problems trying to perform based on certain beliefs, assumptions, and patterns of thought, so that's not gonna solve it. We're gonna have to elevate our consciousness in order to be able to successfully engage the VUCA. There you go. Yeah, you know, I, I've been listening to Rich Green talk about ambiguity tolerance and increasing your ambiguity tolerance for probably two decades. Um, and there is no time that I've been more grateful for that, for those lessons than in the last couple of weeks, for sure. Okay. All right. Could you spend a little more time talking about the connection between leadership and culture? Yeah, so... Uh, and again, I'm expressing my viewpoint. Uh, and there are others, but I think great leaders build strong cultures. And so I see that it's very, very difficult to build a strong culture without great leadership. So this is what I mean. Every dental assistant uh, presentation that I've ever done, I've done a lot. Every single one of them comes with a question of how do I get my dentist to do this? Or how do I get my fellow assistant to do that? Those are all leadership questions, right? And so, uh, so I think cultures really require strong leadership in order to be strong cultures. I think it's very difficult to have it. So that's how I would see the connection because, you know, as the way I pr uh, proposed it, vision, mission, and values are part of it. Well, the vision, mission, and values have to start with a leader and then expand to the whole team uh, collectively. Awesome, thank you. All right, so the next question was, um, how does a coach or working with a coach facilitate um, both leadership and culture development? Well, I think, um, I think it starts with uh, self-awareness. So the very first thing is that that's been, um, through almost all the research, uh, self-awareness has been considered the number one factor in great leadership. So I think it starts with that. You have to know yourself. There was a guy named Dr. Pankey that began with that. I think Dr. Pankey actually meant knowing yourself as at a much deeper level than most of us have thought about that at, quite frankly, or that I did for a long time. So I think it starts um, starts with that. And then uh, the, you know from there, once you see how you actually show up to other people by getting that kind of information. We, we use something called leadership circle profile to do that with, but however you get it, then you get to be like, okay, this is the impact I'm having on people. I need to impact them differently somehow or another. And so that's kind of how I see that. And from there, once you develop that self-awareness, then you have the opportunity 
to um, pay attention to Viktor Frankl. So Viktor Frankl said between stimulus and response is a space. And in that space, you have that opportunity to choose. And in that choice lies your growth and freedom. So he means between what happens to you and how you react, you have the chance to choose, to stop, take a deep breath and choose rather than just react, which is what we've done for most of our lives. So I think it's working through that. I, I don't think it's um, becoming this great dynamic necessarily person. I think it's more of, of developing your inner game so that the outer game shows up differently. Yeah, you know, I was gonna, I was thinking about that. You know, I've spent a lot of time in my own personal life working with different aspects of that relationship. Um, and it's, it's always amazing to me that when I look back, I realized that I actually did the work, but I wouldn't have done the work without the coach being the person there to ask me the probing questions or to ask me things that had me go inside and look and get to know myself and come up with my own answers. Um, you know, and it really is somebody who guides you through a self-awareness process to me more than it is somebody who gives you content. A absolutely. If I could even comment on that, and this is in regards to someone that you know, the really the very first leadership experience I had as far as development was with Brian DeRoche in Seattle at, at a hotel that overlooked the airport there. It's two and a half days. I thought that I was going to do things like the books I had read. I was wrong. It was two and a half days of gut-wrenching group therapy where you really, but you really got through Brian's leadership got to climb inside yourself and see yourself in new ways before. There isn't a day that I don't reference something from that. And, and um, so that was kind of the beginning, but I agree with you. The job of a coach is to hold up a mirror in front of you and help you to see yourself uh, like you've never seen yourself before, hopefully more accurately and objectively. And sometimes the person holding the mirror up, the, the client, sometimes they're a lion and they see a kitten in the mirror sometimes they're a kitten and they see a lion in the mirror both discrepancies are important to resolve and so i think that's the value of of a coach again like a mary osborne or a sherry k or brian or joel and myself There's or a mac mcdonald right yeah <laughs> yes we'd love to talk with anybody that wants to but awesome all right so what was ford's best investment could you repeat what you said uh, ford's best investment was so uh, the, the investment piece was really more about for Ford being a great investment, a great place for investors and institutional banks to invest in them. So it was like about we, Ford had been a horrible investment because their share price, price went down to like a dollar a share in 2006. Um, so it was about restoring the confidence and the view and the reality that they were a great place to invest. So I think the parallel for us is yes, right now we need uh, our bankers to invest in us and to believe in us. And that was one of my first phone calls was, was again to a man that our group and I have worked with for decades. Um, and so he knows us backwards and forwards and he's a partner. And I called him and said, Steve, this is what I think we need. And he responded. And so it was like taking advantage of that because Steve views us as a good investment. We're just in a difficult time. But beyond that, I would say the investment piece is about why should your team invest in you as a leader and your practice as a practice? Because they're investing their lives. And if we're able to draw out that hidden potential, they're investing their heart and souls with our work and with our patients and all, all of that. So I think it's that. Why should the specialists we work with invest in working with us, trusting us, referring patients to us, all the lab technicians, all those kind of things. So I think it's a multitude of those things. Awesome. All right. So, Beck, if you could do us a favor, can you go back a couple slides so that your email is back up on the screen? Because multiple people didn't get a chance to write down your email address. Well, me, Joel, will chastise me for that. And so... <laughs> So will our marketing <laughs> firm. We'll chest All right. So there we go. We've got that on there. Um, there were lots and lots and lots of people saying, thank you. Great presentation. Inspiring. They're feeling motivated. Um, I think yeah. you have your goal of um, blowing some wind in folks' sails and giving them um, something positive and productive to think about. 
Um, I'm going to say thank you so much, Mac, for your time always, um, for being such an incredible uh, member of our community, being the Panky community, the dental community, um, and just everything that you are always so generously willing to give.